We're going to ask uh, John Huston to come up and get us uh, started. So, thanks, John. Welcome to the Welsh Comic Con. <laughs> First of all, thank all of you for being here today. Uh, the the uh, We don't do very many conferences, uh, but uh, the ones that we do have something uh, to do with charity, and this year uh, the Autism Society is, is very close to, to our hearts. Uh, as, as many of you know, we have a 20-year-old son uh, who's on the spectrum, and uh, best thing that ever happened to me, uh, and he's a wonderful, wonderful young man, but um, you know, Autism research is extremely important. Uh, Autism Society does a lot of what's on the ground uh, and in terms of community. And so you being here today is helping the Autism Society and will help a lot of local programs. And my hope is that uh, people who watch the video after this will also feel motivated to make a contribution of $20, $50, $100, if you can afford more, uh, that would be great because all of this uh, is very helpful uh, to the families in individual communities that work with kids with autism. All right, um, the topic of the talk today is, is very mean reversion uh, because we're really at a point where um, we really should be thinking about uh, full cycles and not diagonal lines. One of the things <coughs> that, uh, that we see here, uh, this is a chart uh, of monthly S&P 500 prices since uh, 1995, is we see two advances that we know in hindsight were Fed-induced or Fed-supported uh, financial bubbles. What is almost fascinating is that we're in that third period after five years of relentless quantitative easing, after yield suppression, after yield seeking by investors, feeling like they have nowhere else to go, and yet we have no willingness at all to call this a third Fed-induced bubble in, in 15 years. Um, my wife looked at this chart yesterday when I was putting it together and she said, you know, all this chart needs is, is a little sleigh with the Grinch and his little dog about to ride down into Whoville. Um, so, so you see this sort of uh, pattern in prices. And so the question is, should we think about mean reversion and how should we think about uh, the potential for mean reversion in prices? So. Let's talk a little bit about identifying mean reversion. One of the things that uh, is almost endemic to bubbles, and we saw this in 2000, we saw this in 2007, is um, that, uh, that people like to look at stock prices as if the current price is a norm in some way. And there are arguments that, are, you know, driv that drive those sorts of perceptions. And one of the things that you usually see is some sort of a trend line that people draw from a very low level to the very high level. They say, well, this is the new trend. This is the new normal. Uh, this is the new way that, uh, that, that asset prices are, are going to behave. And uh, we ain't got no stinking mean reversion. Um, you know, they just basically draw a trend line. My assertion is that drawing a visual trend line is a very poor strategy to test for mean reversion. In fact, looking at a series and asking whether it looks like a sine wave is a poor way to test for mean reversion. And the reason is that we don't know at this point what comes next because we don't have that data. There, there, there may be a question there. And, and so the real question is, how do we find out whether a mean reverting process is behaving as it should or whether there is in fact no support for it. And, and the way to identify mean reversion is to relate what's going on in levels with subsequent changes and ask the question, are subsequent changes in the variable of interest inverse to the, the, the initial level? That's really the, the hallmark of mean reversion. What I've, what I've taken here is a sine wave uh, that, that has 80 periods. I haven't you know, put the uh, horizontal axis down. But this is an 80-period sine wave. Uh, 
And one of the things that we see is that mean reverting series often correlate with the subsequent change, particularly over one half and one and a half cycles. Why one half and one and a half? Well, if you're here, uh, then uh, and, and you're and you're headed here. That's a half cycle, right? And so the the extraordinary you know high level in in the measure that we're looking at is going to be inversely correlated with what happens next. You're going to have an extraordinarily strong decline. Uh, and the same is true, of course, if you go out one and a half uh, cycles, because there, you're there, two and a half, three and a half. In sine waves, they're perfect, so you don't get any variation from that. In the real world, uh, things get a little mushier. But generally speaking, if you're looking for mean reversion, uh, it's very hard to predict it over a half cycle. Half cycles tend to be too variable in the real world. But as you go out to periods that look a whole lot more like one and a half cycles, you start getting some, some real predictability. In the stock market, we look at market cycles as somewhere between five and seven years. So once we get out to about seven to 10 years in financial returns, we start seeing this tendency of high valuations to be predictably related to subsequent returns. I'm going to throw um, a couple of extra points at you, uh, which is that if you uh, don't measure exactly over one half or one and a half cycles, you tend to get a little what's called a phase shift. So you still have a very strong tendency for high levels uh, to be followed by poor subsequent action, uh, but but you you'll sometimes see this you know this tendency of of these lines to to look a little off, and that's actually just a phase shift. That that basically tells you that the horizon you're using doesn't fall very well on a half cycle or one and a half cycles. Um, and what's what's important here on these graphs is is, is this this sort of architecture where the blue line here is the actual sine wave. And these, these subsequent changes are changes over you know, the subsequent uh, you know, some number of periods. On the, and they're plotted on the right scale. And this is the important word, inverted. So the, the left scale is the actual level. The right scale and, and these, you know, the, these other um, changes are what happens next but flipped over so that, so that higher levels are worse, right? And so what you're really seeing there is that a high level of, of the variable is being associated with a very poor subsequent outcome, right? All right, this uh, is for the math geeks. I will not uh, walk, walk too much through this, but I want, want to give you a, an idea of the structure of how mean reversion works mathematically. Um, and I'll only spend two minutes here. If you love math, uh, we'll have the um, you know the the slides up, uh, and you can and you can stare at them and that sort of thing. Uh, if you hate math, uh, I've got something that I want you to remember. But uh, but the the basic mean reverting process has has this sort of feature where the future x, whatever x is, if it's prices, if it's earnings, if it's um, you know uh, the population of of geese in Nova Scotia or whatever seems to mean revert over time, uh, is going to be today's value. And then you're going to hit it by this thing. And what this thing is, is m is the mean and x today. And what's happening here is that um, if your variable, whatever your variable is, is well above the mean, right? It, then this number is going to be less than 1. So your future level is going to be something less than your level today. On the other hand, if x is um, you know, extraordinarily low compared to its long-term mean, right, then this number is going to be big. And so your future value is going to be higher than your value today. And of course, we can do the same thing uh, if, if the mean itself grows over time. We can change that equation some. But the thing that I want to to sort of emphasize is that in a standard mean reverting process, and and those of you who have uh, some familiarity with engineering or economic, you know, theory and that sort of thing, uh, if you take the log of this, it's it's and add some randomness, it's an Ornstein-Uhlenbeck process, but um, it's just a standard way of 
talking about mean reversion. The future change, the percentage change in x, is going to be proportional to the ratio of the long-term mean over today's x, right? And that's kind of that's kind of like um, it, it's sort of the inverse of a price earnings ratio or price to valuation measure, right? If if you think about uh, some measure of of long-term value, and then you ask the question, all right, well. Um, you know, what's going to happen in the future, and how do I relate that to my, you know, price to X measure? Well, what this says is basically that if I, you know, if I was to flip that over, you know, if I would take the negative of that, it's basically the log of X over M, which is a valuation measure, right? Price over fair value, right? Um, earnings over, you know, normalized earnings, something like that, right? You're going to find that the future percentage change is proportional to this measure, uh, when x is well above the mean, the future change will be negative. When x is well below the mean, the future change will be positive. And so if we have some fundamental f, right, and this is where all valuation calculations really are trying to get to, if you have some fundamental that's representative of the mean, Right? And it doesn't have to be equal to the mean. It can be proportional to the mean. It can be some multiple of the mean. It, it just has to be representative of the mean in the sense that it, it maintains its proportionality over the long term with what you're really interested in. Right? Uh, and let's say, let's say long-term stock valuation. If you can get some measure that's actually a good representative of long-term value of stocks, then we can use this sort of thing. So some people think that current earnings or, or forward earnings are a good representative of the long-term value of stocks. And so they like to use price to forward operating earnings. Right? I'll, I'll argue shortly that that's an extraordinarily poor measure uh, and, and the reasons why. But if we can find fundamentals that are actually good representatives of long-term value, then what we'll find is that the future percentage change in what we're interested in, right, stock prices, for instance, is going to be inversely related to the present ratio of price to that fundamental, right, or whatever, whatever x we're using, right? So what we're going to find is that the higher the valuation measure, the lower you know, the subsequent return. And that is really how we test for mean reversion. And so this is the point, if you hate math, just remember this, all right? So if you, if you hate math, just clear away everything that I just said, and just remember this. We test mean reversion in X, not by examining X itself. We don't look at charts of X and say, hey, it hasn't come down, so there's no mean reversion. That's not the way to test it. The way to test it is by relating x to some representative fundamental and then checking whether future changes in x are inverse to the present ratio of x to that fundamental. And so let me give you an example. Mean reversion is very hard to detect, to detect directly, right? So this is a chart, uh, could be anything. Uh, you look at this chart visually and you say, what mean reversion? There's no mean reversion here. This thing had a little decline, but then it's on its way, right? Uh, and you could have you made this argument uh, many times in the past on all kinds of variables. You're not going to be able to test for mean reversion just by looking at a chart like that and saying, well, I don't see the sine wave, right? Even the level of x isn't enough to tell the whole story. So. You know, in this particular chart, you saw this thing decline, but now you see it go back up. And so there's some cyclicality, but it doesn't tell you much. And you might say, well, that wasn't so bad, was it? Well, let's actually take a look at what this is. The real tip off to mean reversion is to ask the question, is the level associated with, correlated with, the subsequent change? Right? So, so right here, what we have is we have the market cap of non-financial stocks to nominal GDP. That's what this chart is. Back in 2000, you saw that chart right there. And you could have said, well, this is not a useful series. It's gone on its way. It's, it's, there's no mean reversion here. I can't see it. Right? Um, but the way to test for mean reversion 
was to ask a different question, and that was, is this variable correlated with subsequent changes in market returns? In other words, is a high level of market cap to GDP associated with poor subsequent stock market returns? And the answer is yes. Is a low ratio of market cap to GDP associated with very strong market returns? Answer yes. So you test mean reversion by asking the question, is, by finding some representative fundamental and asking the question, is this variable correlated with subsequent changes in what I care about and correlated inversely so that high levels of my value measure, valuation measure, are associated with poor returns so that low levels of my valuation measure are associated with strong returns. And so what we see here is 2000, right? This is, this is the log of the market cap to GDP ratio. It's, it's, th this is a straight ornstein uhlenbeck process in real life, right? So, so the, the log of this measure is associated with very poor subsequent returns when it's high, very good subsequent returns when it's low. And these aren't just slightly better returns. When, when we're looking back at the 50s and we're looking back at 82, you're, you're talking about subsequent annualized returns of 20% and somewhat expected annualized returns of 20% because back in 82, you had a 6.7% dividend yield, you had a price earnings ratio on normalized earnings that was somewhere around five or six. Uh, and so if you were to expect a normalization in, um, you know, in valuations plus yield, you ended up with numbers that look a whole lot like 20%. On the other hand, when, you're, when you, you were looking in 2000, and the late 90s in fact, uh, you were looking at the prospect of long-term returns over the next decade, uh, and that's what this red line is, is the subsequent 10-year return on the S&P 500. Again, inverted on the right scale, right? So that, so, uh, and in fact, I, I've, I've uh, this the, this should be switched because uh, it's it's left scale log not inverted uh, the right scale is inverted so I've I've uh, flipped that over um, uh, the 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 challenge of using too many charts uh, in my spreadsheets um, <clears throat> but what you have here is on this side you've got inversion of you know this is negative five percent annually for a decade right and that's in fact pretty much what you got. So in 2000, uh, we were saying that stocks were likely to have a decade of negative returns of somewhere around 5% annually. Uh, that was a preposterous statement uh, in the sort of meme of Wall Street at the time, but that's exactly what happened. And it happened because valuations were stretched. It happened because mean reversion had not been broken, it had only been taken to an extreme. So we got a question uh, yesterday, uh, and it was a very good one, is, and, and um, you know, uh, someone asked, is, has a PE of 20 or 25 kind of replaced uh, the, uh, a PE of, say, 15 as kind of the new normal, the new typical? And the answer is only if long-term stock market returns of two or three percent annually have also replaced long-term stock returns of 10 percent annually as the norm. In other words, if you want to say that valuation measures are higher now and that that should be the norm, or that low interest rates now justify higher valuation measures, what you're really saying is that long-term prospective returns should be lower and they should be in the two or three percent annual range looking out a decade. And for people who actually want to make that argument, I have no argument against the, the math. I do have some argument that, that investors really are, are, are fully aware that they've priced securities, you know, especially equities, to return only two or three percent annually over the next decade. Uh, my assertion is that part of what is, seems attractive about junk bonds is that investors have ruled out the prospect that junk bonds actually has, have historically had default rates of about five percent, uh, cumulative default rates, so that you're not going to get that yield back after defaults. So.
um, <clears throat> you know, some of what is going on as investment, uh, as Axel said uh, yesterday, is, is, is based on the idea that there's not volatility, that we don't have risk, that this, these risks won't really amount to much, and therefore, you know, the, the, the yield that I'm looking at on my junk bond is, as hey, that's the yield to maturity. I'm getting more than 5%. People are thinking they're actually going to get that. And in a diversified portfolio of junk bonds, my assertion is that they won't. And they're looking at long-term returns that are much closer to zero than they may be thinking about. And the same kind of thing is true in the equity markets, but for slightly different reasons. Why isn't an equity bubble obvious? Well, the, the, one of the primary reasons, even though valuation measures are elevated relative historical norms, what's really going on here is that profit margins are about 70% above their historical norms for reasons that have a great deal to do with this market cycle, but should not be expected to persist. Uh, and I've included uh, a, uh, a quote from Jeremy Grantham, uh, who very kindly uh, made a couple of mentions in, in his latest letter, so I, so I th thought it was nice to, uh, to return the admiration. Profit margins are probably the most mean reverting series in finance, and if profit margins do not mean revert, then something has gone badly wrong with capitals, capitalism. My assertion is that although a great deal has gone wrong with capitalism, N not enough has gone wrong to wipe out mean reversion over the next 10, 15, 20 years. And in order to really justify what's going on here, you have to make an assertion that, st that profit margins are going to remain elevated and at near record highs, not only for the next two or three years, not for the next five years. You know, people sometimes say, well, you know, profit margins, what if they don't come down over the next couple of years? It doesn't matter because stocks are a claim to a very, 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 very long-term stream of future cash flows that will be delivered into your hands over time. Once you buy that stock, the duration, the effective duration of that, uh, and, and if you're not familiar with the concept of duration, uh, a 30-year zero coupon bond has a duration of 30 because all of your present value comes in at year 30. A uh, 10 year zero coupon bond has a duration of 10 because all of your present value comes in at year 10. A 10% coupon bond has a duration of less than 10. It has a duration of about eight or nine years depending on the coupon because some of your present value is coming in in the early years as dividends, right? Uh, and we can also calculate uh, interesting things about bonds that, that duration is actually a measure of how sensitive that price is to changes in yield. So, at least locally, uh, if you change uh, the interest rate 100 basis points on a 10-year bond, you're going to get uh, a percentage move that's somewhere around 8 or 9 percent. It's, there's a little curvature or convexity, but basically you can, make the, you can make that relationship. The longer the duration the instrument, the more volatile. If I was holding a pencil uh, and, and, you were, and I changed my, my arm like this, the, that, that pencil swings around, right? If I'm holding a bar that goes 30 miles out, if I move my arm like this, right? 30 miles out, somebody hanging on that bar would be swinging around for dear life, right? If I've got a very short duration instrument and I move yields around, not a lot changes, right? Stocks are that, that bar, right? Stocks are basically 50 year duration instruments. And so, the cash flows that you're really bargaining for, for the, uh, at least for the S&P 500 index, are coming over, over a very, very long period of time, even in the, uh, even in the um, uh, presence of buybacks. Because one of the things that's interesting about buybacks is that buybacks are largely a mechanism to uh, return, uh, to, to maintain uh, the float, because uh, you know, we have a, a great deal of stock that's issued to corporate insiders and employees and that sort of thing. So we, what we look at when we see proxies is we'll see two things at the same time. We'll see a big equity packages and we'll also see a desire to, uh, to get approval to buy back shares. Uh, and a lot of those buybacks go to, um, you know, to funding essentially 
those equity, uh, you know, th those equity paybacks. But the basic, uh, the basic mathematics here is that equities are about 50-year instruments, and so you have to be concerned about the the horizon over which uh, over which you're really saying profit margins are going to uh, stay here forever. And by here, uh, based on various me measures, and we'll look at a couple. Uh, if you look at uh, corporate uh, tax, uh, corporate after-tax profits to GDP, uh, not some people don't like this measure, and I'll get to that. Uh, but uh, the historical norm for that is about six percent. Uh, we're a little higher than ten percent. Uh, but is there mean reversion? Again, the test for mean reversion isn't just to look at this and say, "Oh, hey, it's too high. It's 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 gone off. It doesn't mean revert anymore. Don't worry about it anymore." No. The way that you test for mean reversion is to ask the question, do subsequent changes run inverse to present levels? And so far they do, right? So we really had, um, you know, the, what's interesting is that we were having the same arguments essentially with the same people here and here, right? We were basically saying in 2000 that uh, the technology stocks were essentially cyclicals and that the valuations that were being placed on those uh, were based on the idea that earnings only go up and that, and that profit margins in technology don't vary over economic cycles. And in fact, if you look at tech earnings, tech earnings look a whole lot like cyclicals. Uh, and back here, we were having the same arguments with, uh, with certain people who believe in stocks in the long run. Uh, and, um, and basically that was followed by a 55% collapse in the S&P. So we're, we're having this argument uh, at somewhat higher levels of profit margin, and there may be some uh, arguments why we may not have full mean reversion. But as, as we saw in a chart much earlier, uh, we didn't need to see unbelievable full mean reversion in market cap to GDP in order to see two separate 50 percent plus declines in the stock market. So to say that we have mean reversion doesn't require that we get mean reversion all the way down. This is something that people ask me a lot. They say, well, what, what's going to take to get you to take a more aggressive equity position? Do we need to see valuations go all the way to their historical means? Do, do we need to see stocks lose half their value? And the answer is no. Uh, there are some things that we talk about in our weekly comments that have to do with that 2009-2010 period, and you can go back to those because I won't get into some of the stress testing things. But really what drives the best opportunity to buy stocks is a combination of at least reasonable valuations and some improvement in market action following that decline. Early improvement in market action, positive divergences, uniformity. Uniformity of trends across securities is basically an indication of increasing tolerance for risk. And after you see a big decline where you see everything dropping all at once, as you're starting to see new lows and things aren't participating as much in, you know, it, it jointly, and you start seeing positive divergences, that's, that's a sign of early improvement in market action. And there are ways to measure that. But that's really where you want to uh, you want to look for opportunities. You look for reasonable valuations, you look for some early improvement in market action, uh, and that happens in every cycle. And it doesn't require stocks to go all the way to the floor. What it requires, though, is that we don't sit at valuations that are about 100% above their historical norm, and we'll get to the, those numbers because I think that that's a pretty accurate assessment of valuations here. So. Uh, not everyone likes uh, corporate after-tax profits uh, from uh, the, the Commerce Department. So there are other variants that you can use. You can use uh, domestic corporate profits after tax versus domestic final sales. Uh, and you see basically the same thing. Uh, we really haven't seen a variation in the long-term mean reversion of profit margins. If you are looking for mean reversion, again, you don't say, hey, this is high. And if I draw some arbitrary trend line from here to here, they're just going higher or whatever people want to say. You look for mean reversion by asking the question, is the level of this thing inversely correlated to what happens next? Right? And, and by, by, uh, by every measure, practically, when you use uh, corporate taxes, uh, corporate earnings over revenues, uh, 
uh, you see exactly the same story. Mean reversion has not broken in profits. But why are profit margins so high? Why have they been so high? And the answer is, we know exactly why they've been so high, because corporate profits are a surplus in the business sector that acts as a mirror image of deficits in other sectors, right? So if you look at all sectors, you, you have to have surpluses and deficits uh, basically even out. And what's going on with corporate profits, and, and there's a whole lot in, um, on the website, uh, if you look at um, an open letter to the Federal Reserve uh, recognizing the uh, bubble in uh, equity prices, which is from last year, what you'll see is, um, uh, you'll see sort of an analysis of this using Kalecki equations and so forth. Uh, but basically, if you look at uh, deficits in other sectors, uh, and particularly uh, government and personal savings as a percentage of GDP, what you see is that corporate profits as a share of GDP are indeed a mirror image of that. Um, and there's, there's uh, nothing in this dynamic that's changed. Uh, we can also look at it from the standpoint of business revenues and costs. If we look at the GDP deflator, you can kind of think of growth in the GDP deflator as, as representing kind of what, what uh, corporations are getting. If you look at um, the, uh, the unit labor cost, uh, you'll kind of see what corporations are paying out as, um, you know, as wages for a, a dollar, for a unit of a good. And what you would expect is that corporate profits are largely tied to that difference between the GDP deflator and you know, unit labor costs. And in fact, that turns out to be true. So nothing in this dynamic has changed again. We know why corporate profits have been high, but we also see at this point um, something that we didn't see a couple of years ago, which is that we're starting to see erosion here. We're starting to see erosion in uh, the, um, the, the size of these other deficits. We're starting to see them improve, and that suggests erosion over, say, uh, you know, a, a few years in corporate profits. So what does that mean for stocks? Well, we've talked about margins, we've talked about profits, we've talked about mean reversion. Let's put some of this together. Every security is a claim on a, an expected stream of future cash flows that's gonna be delivered over time. Again, these are very, very long things. They're not two years, they're not three years. We're something like 50 years. The higher the price an investor pays for a certain stream of cash flows, the lower the expected return. Uh, so so um, just a real quick uh, way to think about this. If I taped a $100 bill at the corner of that room and you were to pay $30 today for that $100 a 10, year, 10 years from now, well, if, if you're paying that, you're probably making somewhere around a 12% annual rate of return. But if I raise the price to something like you know, $80 for that $100 bill over a 10 year period, you're, you're gonna make much closer to something like 4% annually. And if I ask you to pay $99.50 today for that $100 10 years from now, you're gonna get a return of about zero. So as you pay a higher price for a stream of cash flows, you are going to get a lower expected return. As you pay a lower price for that stream of cash flows, you're going to get a higher expected return. And a reliable fundamental, the key characteristic is that it has to be a sufficient statistic for that whole stream of future cash flows. What you want for a valuation measure is something that's roughly proportional over time to that stream of cash flows, not just a year or two of it, but if you were to add them all together, if you were to take them out over 50 years, if you were to do your math, you would get a number uh, for, say, discounted future cash flows that I'm getting, and you would get a fundamental that, that moves relatively uh, well proportional to that. That's the kind of fundamental that you're looking for. And so then the higher ratio of price to that fundamental the lower the expected return and vice versa, even if that fundamental is growing over time. And this is sort of the holy grail of what we're trying to get at, right? The problem is that current earnings are terribly unrepresentative 
as sufficient statistics for long-term cash flows. In some cases, for some individual companies, you know, Warren Buffett, wide moat type stocks, companies that have very strong franchises, very strong competitive advantages, uh, very, very stable revenues, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you can find individual companies where their earnings are very good representatives of the long-term cash flow because you don't have a lot of cyclicality, you don't have a lot of profit margin fluctuation. But for the broad number of stocks out there, uh, and certainly for the market as a whole, current earnings are a terribly unreliable measure of the, the long-term cash flows that you're going to get. And so uh, I think Benjamin Graham had it exactly right, and nothing has changed since he wrote security analysis. Observation over many years has taught us that the chief losses to investors come from the purchase of low-quality securities at times of good business conditions. The purchasers view the current earnings as equivalent to earning power, and earning power is what we're calling F. Earning power is that long-term fundamental that we're really trying to get at, and assume that prosperity is equivalent to safety. And this is a mistake that people have made in every market cycle over time, right? Now, what I'm not saying here is that earnings are unimportant. Earnings are very necessary to generate the cash flows that you're gonna get over time. The problem is that margins are too variable to use earnings as a sufficient statistic. So what I'm not saying is that we can discard profits, we can not care about profitability, we cannot care about cost controls or anything like that. All of those things are essential. But what I am saying is that as a sufficient statistic of value, earnings are fairly lousy, and they're fairly lousy even if you take 10-year averages and so forth. So if you look at this statistically, what you find is that margins and multiples matter jointly. So, uh, so what we have here is basically um, some regressions. And uh, I, I actually am not a big fan of regressions generally, but uh, th in this case, they're particularly telling because of what the coefficients are doing, right? What, what I've basically done is I've, I've basically said, all right, let's take the 10-year return of the market, of the S&P 500, the actual 10-year total return of the S&P, and now let's regress it on two variables. And depending on what measure of valuation I'm going to use, I'm going to use a slightly different uh, formulation. But basically, uh, you can take, uh, for instance, um, here's the easiest one, uh, trailing 12-month profit margins and the S&P 500 trailing PE, right? Um, the PE, right, is, is you know, what people sometimes use for valuation. Normally, they don't use trailing, but you could. And then you could also say, all right, well, what's the profit margin at any given time? And let me take those two variables and run a regression. It'll turn out that if you use PEs alone, especially trailing PEs, you get a very poor fit. And that's why people use Schiller PEs and other things, because they know that. They know that just the, uh, the, the rough and ready you know, trailing 12-month PE doesn't do a very good job. But what's interesting is that if you throw in the margin, it does an enormously good job. It does, and, and, and what's interesting about that is that if you look at these uh, coefficients, these regression coefficients, they're about the same size. They're negative, of course, because subsequent returns are negatively correlated with your valuation measure, but these, these numbers are about the same size. And the same is true if we look at, for instance, Schiller's cyclically adjusted PE, and then we ask the question, well, what's the profit margin embedded in that? In other words, if I take Schiller earnings and I divide by S&P 500 current revenues, there, there's an implied profit margin. What if I throw that into the mix? And it turns out, again, that if you look at these coefficients, they're very, very close, right? And, and you can do all kinds of interesting ones like, you know, the price to book ratio and then book value over revenue, which is kind of an odd number, but you, you also get almost identical coefficients there. You get almost identif identical coefficients if you take sort of a PE ratio using the Wilshire 5000 versus uh, corporate profits after tax, and then, you know, the, the, the basically, uh, you know, the economic profit margin here. Uh, you do the same thing if you use forward operating PEs and the forward operating margin, although you have to impute that prior to 1980, uh, but there are good ways to impute uh, forward operating earnings.
Uh, and what you see, again, is that these coefficients are almost the same. What does that mean? What it means is that you could combine those two variables costlessly without losing information, right? If, you, if the price earnings ratio and the, associated price, uh, and the associated profit margin have the same regression coefficient, you could just, and, and these are logarithms, so the sum of logarithms is like the product of the ordinary variables, right? What you're really looking at in all these cases is that what's really capturing the explanatory power in all cases, because the regression could give different coefficients, they just don't, right? They could, if, if, if the Schiller PE really meant something totally on its own, then it would get more weight or it would get a different weight than the profit margin. But the fact that the, the, these things have almost the same uh, coefficients, and in fact, you can, you can test that you don't lose explanatory power by combining them, what's really going on is that revenues, in all cases, are a better sufficient statistic of the long-term valuation of equities than all of these other measures of earnings. And so as you get to uh, valuation measures, you have to think very carefully about normalizing the earnings that are under them to reflect the embedded profit margin. Right? You can't take these valuation measures on their own. Um, so margins and multiples matter jointly. Here's another way to see it. Uh, if you do a nice 3D plot, uh, if I was to spin this around so you look at uh, 10 year returns versus the profit margin, you're gonna get a very bad fit. You're gonna get this whole scatter of points and people very rightly have said, well, look, what happens to stocks has very little to do with profit margins. There's not a great correlation and there's not, it's a big scatter. In fact, if I switched this the other way, if I took that, uh, th this axis and I, and I spun this graph around and I showed you returns against PEs and I just pulled this around, uh, you would see the same sort of scatter. But what's interesting about uh, 3D charts, and you can prove this to yourself, you can run like two series of random numbers, and then you can have Z be the sum of them, is that if you look right at the corner, if you, if you shift your perspective to right, right at that corner of you know, the, the maximum of one and the minimum of the other, uh, you will actually see all of those points converge if they're, if, if, your z value of this thing is the sum of these guys, right? Or the product of these guys. And you can, and you can prove that to yourself if you've got MATLAB or something where you can like s switch around 3D graphs. But basically what's going on is that where are the bad returns coming? Where are the very low S&P 500 annual returns coming? They're coming where the price earnings ratio is relatively high and the margin is also relatively high. Right? So in other words, you're not only got, you've not only got high profits because margins are elevated cyclically, but you're also paying a lot of dollars for each dollar of those earnings. Right? So you're doing double duty in terms of paying for stocks. You're paying for elevated profit margins that are not likely to last, and now you're even paying a high pro price earnings ratio on those. Right? <clears throat> That's why you get poor returns uh, and you get stronger returns in combinations that give you relatively better value for your dollar. Uh, same thing happens when you look at the Schiller PE and the Schiller implied margin. The Schiller PE isn't, isn't uh, actually a really great uh, valuation measure in itself, but if you also take into account the implied profit margin, it becomes an extraordinarily good measure. Uh, the problem is that if you do that today, then you actually, you actually are looking at a Schiller PE that's much closer to 30 than to 25. So, so if you adjust for the embedded level of profit margins in Schiller earnings, uh, you're actually looking at a Schiller PE right now that's, that's, that's very high. Uh, that's the little red, gra uh, red dot here. Um, and it is not, uh, this is not a pretty level of uh, prospective long-term returns. Right?
Uh, so it, we can do some calculations uh, based on mean reversion and and assumptions that stocks, you know, stocks uh, in terms of valuation mean revert over some horizon, right? If you make an assumption that valuations are going to mean revert over a two-year period, you're going to have a lot of noise in that forecast. You're not going to do very well uh, with with your expectations because, generally speaking, two years is much too short to expect a significant mean reversion in valuations. Uh, and so if you use uh, various various uh, calculations, and, and they're on the website, there, there are a bunch of different models, and this is sort of an average of some of them. Uh, but these are 10-year projections compared, uh, I'm sorry, two-year total return projections based on valuations and based on the assumption of mean reversion over that period versus actual S&P 500 returns. If you look at two-year there's a lot of noise in here, and these these bands are one standard deviation bands either way from the from the mean. Uh, if you if you actually did get uh, mean reversion over the next two years, uh, you would be looking at uh, total returns in the S and P over the next two years of about negative twenty percent. Right, so so you wouldn't you shouldn't be surprised in that case to see stocks down almost by half over a two year period if you're going to get full mean reversion. I don't expect that, and there's much too much uh, variation in two year returns. So valuations are not a timing tool. Valuations are often uh, also not a timing tool at a three year horizon. If you're a value investor, you've got to be prepared to take heat for a long time because mean reversion does not happen overnight. And sometimes when the Fed is uh, really pushing things and people believe it, and people believe that the Fed was responsible for ending the crisis, I don't, FAS 157 did that. Um, but if people believe it, you can push these, this mean reversion for some time. So significant errors even at a three-year horizon. Uh, as you start um, lengthening your horizon, you start seeing actual returns, which are in red, um, looking a lot closer to what you would have expected. There's still these problems with what we now label bubbles in hindsight, right? We label this period, this five-year period from uh, about 1995 to 2000, we label that as a bubble in hindsight, right? We label this as a bubble when we when we looked at uh, you know from 2002 to 2007 we labeled that the housing bubble right and we've got a similar thing going on today so these bubble periods have certainly messed up with the short term mean reversion but over the long term you're not seeing you know a, a full scale departure from this and as you start extending your horizon uh, to about seven years and then to ten years and then to fifteen years you start getting much closer fit. Now, by the time you get to 15 years, you're still only looking at a prospective return of about 4.4% annually. So if you're buying stocks at present prices, you're looking at a, a expected total return by our calculations of less than 5%. That doesn't mean that stocks are not a buy for the next 15 years. We have to think at current prices. So even a one year, a two year, even a decline in stock valuations five years from now could dramatically change things. It uh, could dramatically change things over six months in some cases, where stocks all of a sudden are a reasonable, you know, a reasonable buy or an attractive buy. So I'm not saying that stocks are dead for 15 years. What I'm saying is if you lock in that chart where the Grinch was sitting on his sleigh, uh, at these prices, you're not likely to get uh, a significant investment return over the next 15 years. Once you look at uh, about 20 years, uh, prospective returns are still only about 5.5%. What's happening here? There are two things going on. One of the things you'll notice is that the, the, the range of variation is getting narrower, which goes to uh, a question that I got from Bob Hubscher uh, at Advisor Perspectives. It is true that as you increase the time horizon, the, the, the uh, expected range of error narrows, right? But what's helping you out here is, is there's an embedded growth assumption in these calculations, about 6.3% nominal GDP growth, which is historical, you know, kind of the historical average. If you don't believe that 6.3 number, just subtract you know what you know to the to the level that you think is likely, right? Uh, but it, and that's a very linear calculation. Uh, so if we get much slower GDP growth nominally than 6.3 percent, you just subtract off a little bit. 
Um, but even if you assume 6.3 percent, which we which we have embedded in these models, you're looking at about a five and a half percent annual return. But there is some variation. You might get as much as say seven percent uh, if you're standard deviation off the norm. Um, but what's happening is that growth is kind of bailing you out over time, right? So you've got a valuation pressure that's that's taking returns down. You've got growth that's taking returns up toward 6.3 percent plus dividends, right? Uh, and so there, so you're getting sort of a sort of a little drag higher. Uh, you also notice that there's a little bit of uh, off phase behavior here, which basically suggests. That uh, that 20 years is probably not the optimal horizon if you're trying to look at you know sort of harmonics of a half cycle. Um, this is what this whole set of charts looks like altogether. Prospective returns are negative at horizons of less than seven years. You do have more variation, uh, more range of variation at low you know at 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 short horizons. But even over a two-year horizon, our expectation is that stocks bought here will not make you money. So we're looking at uh, the likelihood that what you are seeking from your investments is already on the table. What quantitative easing has done is not created wealth. It's just brought future returns into present prices. They're on the table. Um, this is a good time to be thinking about alternatives. When we get returns, prospective returns much higher, and you can do that math, and, and it's, it's not difficult to do, there are certainly periods where Valuations are high, and you can, you know, are, are are low enough that prospective returns are high, and you can get six, eight, seven, ten, whatever in there. Then you can make your choice to move toward more conventional allocations. But right now, our our view is that uh, alternative assets, as they were in 2000, as they were in 2007, are probably places to to consider for some portion of your portfolio. Um, reliable valuation measures. If we look at these things that are normalized by profit margins, what we find is numbers that are about 80 or 100 percent overvalued. Some of them, uh, for instance, uh, you know, um, market cap to GDP is, is is pretty elevated. Price revenue ratios are pretty elevated. Those no, those numbers actually exceed 100 um, percent. But if you take those and you calculate prospective returns out of them, and there are a bunch of models that we have on the website that are just algebra, and if you're in the business of managing money, these are things that I, I would highly encourage having spreadsheets for uh, because it's useful. Uh, it, it gives you a sense of how to talk to clients about prospective returns. Even if you're a long-only manager uh, and, and you have conventional investments, at least you can pare back people's expectations or give them a little more reason to take risk if you know what prices, what stocks are likely to achieve over the next decade. And what you see here is that the actual subsequent returns don't deviate a whole lot from these models, right? So they're, they're relatively good models. They've got about a 90% correlation with subsequent returns. But right now, you're looking at low single digit expectations for a decade, right? That will change. That will change. It will change over the course of the next cycle. It will change over the next half cycle. So this is not a long-term you know, sentence to dismal returns. This is basically uh, advice to be cautious at these levels because history is not on the side of people who think that they're going to get strong investment returns from here. Uh, so to end, is not different this time. Reversion to the mean, and I love this quote because it's from John Bogle, no less. Uh, reversion to the mean is the iron rule of financial markets. Uh, Bogle is very well aware, and he, he tries to even talk to long-only investors saying, look, 30%, 20%, even 50% corrections are part of what you bargain for with a buy and hold strategy. And, and if you are following that strategy, and if you're very clear about what those risks are, that's great. But it's important to actually take those seriously because we have been in a period of very low volatility and diagonal prices, and it's easy for people to forget these things. Um, uh, security analysis by Ben Graham and, and David Dodd. Uh, for those, uh, many shall be restored that are now fallen, and many shall fall that are now in honor. Uh, and I think that's just as true for individual stocks as is, is true for uh, certain risk-averse money managers. Uh, 
And uh, Jeremy, again, I got wiped out personally in 1968, which was really the last crazy, silly stock market before the internet era. I became a great reader of history books. I was shocked and horrified to discover what I had just learned, that I had just learned a lesson that was freely available all the way back to the South Sea bubble. And this is what the, the kind of things that make people value investors. A uh, couple of addenda charts. This is a Schiller PE on normalized basis. We'd be about here. This is not cheap. I don't know exactly why someone would, would say, well, I only get worried if the Schiller PE is in the high 20s, because, uh, uh, because if you're looking at those points where the Schiller PE was in the high 20s, you were looking at 10-year negative real returns in every case. Uh, median and mean price revenue ratios among individual S&P 500 components, this is not cheap, right? The average stock this time is extremely overvalued. In 2000, it was, it was really skewed toward large caps. Small caps were actually kind of okay. They were actually reasonable values because they had gone through hell because people didn't want them. They wanted the big techs. Uh, we're in a different world right now. Median price to revenue ratio, highest ever. Right? Uh, a hideous opportunity set to use uh, uh, Jim Montier's words. Uh, this is a balanced portfolio of conventional assets. Uh, you're looking at very low prospective returns. So this is why I suggest that alternatives as a mix of your portfolio would be helpful. And then uh, just a side note, some of the other consequences of yield seeking go beyond equity markets. Uh, we have now seen U.S. leveraged loan issuance uh, reach a record 53% of year-over-year -year total loan issuance last year. So more than half of the loans being made are to already highly indebted borrowers. A lot of that is going to LBOs, leveraged buyouts for stocks. Uh, they accounted for 62% of U.S. loan issuance in the first quarter of 2014. Uh, and the dollar value uh, has now clearly exceeded the peak that we th saw in 2007. So I hope some of this is helpful. Uh, my, my strongest advice is to understand the structure of prospective returns so that you have some sense of how valuations and prospective returns go hand in hand and to have some of those calculations and some of those tools so that you can sort of guide your risk aversion or your risk tolerance based partly on valuations. Of course, other measures, value, you know, market action, if you have technical uh, components to what you do, if you have monetary components to what you do, that's great. Test them and make sure that, uh, you know, that they're effective because people who say, don't fight the Fed, we had two 50% market declines in 2000, 2002, 2007, 2009, and the Federal Reserve was aggressively easing the whole way down. So be careful about what you believe and actually test it against the data and make sure that what you're using is something that provides you a good expected return and you know, good control of risk. Uh, and I hope that's helpful and thank you very much. All right, uh, John Hussman back up here. He's gonna talk for a minute on the uh, Autism Society. So first of all, I, I really want to thank all of you for being here. Um, this is not just uh, for for me. It's it's really energizing to be around. You know, uh, people who who think um, I can put a period there. Actually, uh, in some cases, <laughs> with with respect to finance, I could I could almost put a period there. Um, but really, who think about all these issues, and um, you know, really want to thank Mish and Steen and Chris uh, Meb. Uh, Jim, Stephanie, and uh, and Axel for being here because this is not just an investment conference. This is a charitable event, and it's a charitable event for for us for something that is really important to us, which is autism. Uh, as you know, I have a 20 year old son who has autism. He's he's partially verbal. He's he's a great kid. Um, autism is 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 kind of interesting. It, it, a, about a month ago, Center for Disease Control uh, came out with a new statistic that one in 68 children is now diagnosed on the autism spectrum. Uh, and that's up from one in 88 uh, children two years ago. So that's a 30% increase in the number of kids with that diagnosis. And, and uh, there's a lot of conversation about what's going on there. Um, autism is a, a condition that's, that's really defined 
uh, and diagnosed by its symptoms. And the symptoms include uh, challenges with communication, uh, behaviors and repetitive and restrictive interests and this sort of thing, uh, and also uh, social interaction. And so families who face, uh, you know, trying to help a child with autism have enormous tasks. Uh, and sometimes it's, it's extremely challenging in, you know, behavior, sometimes it's extremely challenging in social interaction. Uh, but there's, there's a, a great deal of stress that, that families experience uh, in trying to help a person with autism. One of, one of the ways to think about autism more generally is that the characteristics of autism are, are, are in some sense, characteristics that you and I share but taken to a point where they become very difficult in terms of in terms of actually um, getting through the day, actually uh, affecting you know sort of a, sort of a child's ability to function, right? Uh, in in typical interactions and so forth. And and I have a chart. Uh, a lot of the characteristics that we have in um, you know human variation, height, uh, you know speaking ability. Um, you know, uh, uh, math ability, uh, different different characteristics can be thought of as a on a um, you know bell shaped curve, right? Uh, and we think of you know height as uh, you know and weight, and we could we could do all do these sort of distributions. What does it mean for one in sixty eight kids to be diagnosed with autism from one in eighty eight? What it really means is in two thousand twelve, if you think about characteristics being sort of on a bell curve and, and clinical autism, you know, the diagnosis being sort of the extreme of characteristics that we all share. Uh, in 2012, you know, one in uh, 88 children works out to about 2.28 standard deviations from the average. Uh, now, one in 68 children it actually only ends up being about 2.18 standard deviations. So the, that that what seems like a very scary, um, you know, epidemic is actually a tenth of a standard deviation on um, a bell-shaped curve. But it's far enough out that uh, that you get a significant shift. In fact, you capture 30% more kids in that uh, in that group. And you know, if you think about the different characteristics that you have, uh, some of us have uh, you know a lot of challenges um, in terms of you know changing a routine because we're really attached to a particular routine. Some of us get very uh, stressed out in in situations, social inter you know situations where we have to speak publicly. Some some of us, uh, my wife has um, a particular. Um, the thing where as she's driving, she'll add up uh, the numbers on license plates to see if they can be divided by seven, right? So all of us have these <laughs> very specific, um, you know, things that that we all share, but taken to a particular point could become really challenging in our lives. And that's really the case for our children with autism. So, you know, part of what these kids need is research. Um, to to really identify what's going on and try and find ways to help. Uh, part of what these kids need is better services and supports. Uh, but a lot of the, the things that they really need are things that we can do, um, which are uh, really to embrace them as as being like us rather than different from us. Uh, because you know a lot of people with autism, especially you know adults that we talk to, aren't looking to be cured. What they feel is that they feel like they're marginalized and they're not included in society and they're not embraced for who they are. And so one of the ways that we can do that is by really trying to, to embrace um, you know, initiatives that, that accept kids with autism, that integrate them into the community, uh, for the kids who aren't verbal, we always say, just because somebody can't speak doesn't mean they don't have something to say. Uh, and so we can look at people with autism and really think about, um, you know, the, the fact that their ability to think may not be reflected in their ability to move or their ability to speak and, and to really recognize that there, there are things going on inside that are just like you and I. Uh, so, so one of the things that a, that a conference like this does that raises funds uh, 
for autism is it goes out and then helps families. Uh, and the Autism Society, I, I can tell you from my, my personal experience, when we moved to Howard County, we got involved with the Howard County Autism Society in, in Maryland. And they were enormously helpful in helping us navigate the school system, giving us, you know, giving us support uh, with other families uh, that have autism. So it's a really great cause, you know, to the extent uh, I'm, I'm hopeful that when we get the videos up on uh, the site that we can put, you know, some links and hopefully raise some funds from people who watch the videos because I think that would be fantastic.